Good morning. Okay, I think we might be there. Oh, there okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. it's a, a case of um, He's just trying to make sure we were in under the right things, and then I completely forgot our phone number, which is our login. So that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here. Welcome. It's good to, to see you all, and um, thank you for spending another sun, sunny Sunday morning um, inside uh, Zoom with us and with each other. I'm going to do a slightly different kind of call to worship um, today. Uh, I'm going to, um, it's going to be a slightly longer one and it's going to be a kind of a way of, of stilling ourselves um, and just kind of taking a moment to breathe. Um, and to aid us, I'm going to share an image that was on the Our Money Feast um, page not that long ago. So, if you are ready. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. We worship the God who inhabits our world and indwells our life. We need not always look up to find God. We need only look around, within ourselves, between each other, into the eyes of another. We need not listen for distant thunder to find God. We need only listen to the music of life, the words of children, the questions of the curious, the rhythm of a heartbeat. We Worship the God who inhabits our world and indwells our lives. Our first hymn for this morning is a favourite one and well, it's someone's favourite one. It might not be your favourite one. Um, and it's been recorded for us by the lockdown lyricist who is Adam Elder. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day, dawn. Whatever may 
Let us pray. There are so many reasons to worship you, O oh God. Sun, moon and stars, hills, lochs and valleys, daisies, tulips and magnolias, tadpoles, whales and otters, caterpillars, butterflies and eagles, friends, family and sojourners on life's journey. All speak of your creative word, your life-giving spirit, and we rejoice to know you as our loving God. Yet you are also a restless God, always doing a new thing. We confess that sometimes we close windows against the fresh air of new ideas, against the noise of other people's worries, against the winds of change. We can draw the curtains against people who are different, against world news or community concerns, shutting out the world in a bid to keep ourselves safe. Help us to be humble enough to admit when we don't know, hospitable enough to welcome travellers along the way, and curious enough to be open to new interpretations of life. May your mercy surround us always as we seek to grow in likeness of Christ, even as we pray these words of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning, as we're thinking about resurrection and transformation of what that might mean. Today I've got two really quite short poems and an image called Dusk by Sherry Rowe Dirksen. The poems come from um, a Mother's Union collection of poems and they are entitled At the Cross and Christianity respectfully. So I'll share the artwork entitled Dusk. There we go. And as I say, two short poems.
at the cross, earth meets heaven, pain meets bliss, sorrow meets joy, sin meets grace. Fear meets faith, law meets love, absence becomes presence, death becomes life. Who is my Lord? Lightfoot by the lakeside, leaving breath, brief footprints in the grass. He is implied rather than implicit, a flicker in the corner of my eye, a shift of sun. I can no more lay my hands on him than catch the wind. But as the wind can touch and tremor me, fan out water, stir sounds and scents, so can he, me. Our next hymn is another person's favourite. Um, and one that you probably know more than the last one we had, um, the Church's One Foundation. Apologies, everyone, we're having another issue. Apologies. Okay, I think um, for the purposes of practicality and my sanity, we're going to go with the, the hymn that was going to be third. And apologies to those um, who uh, likes the Church's One Foundation. So we're going to sing, we know that Christ is raised and dies no more. Hopefully. Thank you. 
okay, I promise we didn't have a domestic during that hymn. <laughs> promise, we really didn't. Anyway, we come to our scripture reading for this week and we continue our um, journey through Acts. And this week we're going to um, hear the story of Philip, uh, read to us by Anne Jack. So Anne, if you give me a second to pull up the scripture and you can unmute yourself and get ready to go. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an, Ep an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Kandeshi, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? and he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before his shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Amen. Thank you, Anne. I think I have perhaps spoken before about something called liminal space or liminality. And if I haven't, or you weren't there that day, um, let me just kind of unpack that a little bit for you. Liminality or liminal space is something like a threshold. So a lot of people talk about Iona, for example, as being a liminal space, a place in which heaven touches earth in a way that it doesn't in other places. Um, I imagine Jane would back me up on that and she's nodding. A place I find liminal in a slightly different way is the Culloden battlefield. I don't know if you have ever visited it, but it is a space where, although a battle was fought there 275 years ago, almost exactly, you can still almost feel the souls of the people that had been there. There's something, there's just something about it. There's also liminal times um, in life, and the two most obvious would be labour and birth and end of life and death. Those moments where it's a threshold time. The Bible has a number of liminal times and liminal spaces. 
One of the most obvious is the 40 years that the Israelites spent in the wilderness between leaving Egypt and getting to the promised land. And that's echoed in Jesus's temptation in the desert and also to a large extent our experience of Holy Saturday, that moment between Jesus dying and to news of his resurrection. In many ways, I see this story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch as something of a liminal story, both in Acts and in the story of the church as a whole. So remember the journey we've had thus far from, from resurrection uh, news to the disciples um, uh, preaching to the people of Jerusalem and Jesus says you're going to go out to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And immediately before this reading, we had Stephen um, being stoned. We heard that last week, and that scatters people um, in the face of persecution. And Philip has gone to Samaria, and people are being um, baptised in the name of Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. And before we get to all the random travels of Paul all over the place and shipwrecks and imprisonments, we have this little story about Philip and the eunuch. And why do I think it's wilderness? <clears throat> or sorry, why do I think it's liminal? Well, first of all, it happens on a wilderness road. It happens between two places. And so the, the, the space is liminal and there's also this weird thing where Philip's kind of taken away by the Holy Spirit and he's brought there by the Spirit and all these kinds of things. But in many ways, the eunuch himself is a kind of liminal person. It wasn't uncommon for court officials, male court officials, to be castrated so that they couldn't father the children of the queen or whatever. So it was to make sure that the king was actually the father. That's why eunuchs were used in these things. So he's, he's male, but he's not male. He, if, if he was at the temple in Jerusalem, there's certain parts that he might not have been able to enter um, at, that was reserved for males only, and he wouldn't have been allowed in. He's also from Ethiopia, and so, um, or the, the, the sense of being from Ethiopia actually just means has really dark skin. So he looks different. He's physically different from those that he sees in Jerusalem. But actually, there's a sense in which he might actually be Jewish of, of some description or certainly has a sense of worshipping the Israelite God as a God fearer. And so we have a space and a person that to me together embodies liminality. And why is liminality important? Well, it's important because throughout the Bible, it is in the space of liminality that God does God's most transforming work. And arguably, our sacraments of baptism, the drowning and death with Jesus and the resurrection to new life and the sharing of Christ's last meal are liminal moments where heaven touches earth. And one of the questions the eunuch asks in this liminal moment is, here is some water, what's preventing me from being baptised? Now, like um, a lot of stories in the Bible, if you've heard it a number of times, you don't notice something that's actually really quite obvious. And in conversation with Andrew Kimmett, who is also preaching on this passage this week, um, he said that he was really taken by this idea of what's preventing me from being baptized. He was looking for a reason for him to be excluded once again. And that, that got me wondering about what prevents us doing things in our lives. Whether that is on our own journey of faith, or whether it is just in life in general. So here 
Here are two um, anecdotes from my own life, one older, one very immediate, um, that, that offers that. When I was sort of three or four months into the Navy, we had to go do all our sea survival training. And I'm not great with heights, and I'm even worse with the sensation of dropping, high assertion. And one of the things, or the two of the things you have to do, one thing you have to do in sea survival is jump off a 30 foot um, platform into a lake. And that was bad enough, but I got that. I, 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 just, I just went and stepped and did it and it was fine. Another thing we had to do was go down a kind of chute. So in, in merchant vessels, they have this process where there's like a chute that takes you into the life raft so that you remain dry. It's a really good idea to remain dry if you can when you go into a life raft. Um, but the chute that drops is about 30 feet. And to drop in this chute, you put your hands on a bar and you, and you dangle your body above the chute and then you have to let go. I couldn't let go. I could not let go. I was hanging there thinking, someone's gonna to have to prize my fingers off. I eventually did it. I, and I, I, I had to get someone to tie my boots at the other end because I was shaking so much from it. But it is that idea of what do we, at what points in our life do we cling on so tight because we, we're, we don't know what's gonna happen next or we're scared of what's happening next that we're prevented from, from taking a step forward. Another slightly more mundane one is I'm facing at the moment is I really need to get around to making some new clergy tops for myself. I've put on weight during lockdown like a number of people have and they're hideously expensive. And the only reason I took up sewing two years ago was so I can make my own clergy wear three years ago. But I haven't, I can't work up the courage to do it. There's something about what if I, what if I make a mess of it? What if it doesn't fit properly? And so that fear of getting it wrong, it not being perfect, it has meant that I haven't even tried for years. And that's the whole reason I learned to sew in the first place. There are things in our lives that prevent us from doing things that we want to, perhaps that we need to, or even that we feel called to. Those preventions could be things and structures around us, like the eunuch. For not too many people in our, in our society, the limitations are, are the structures around them or the poverty that they face or the lack of sensitive, appropriate education. For a lot of us, the prevention is something within us, a, a voice or a fear that says, it's not worth the risk. It's not worth the risk. And I think there's a lot of that in our faith. What prevents us from doing stuff um, out of our faith or sharing our faith with others? I don't know your reasons. Perhaps you can dwell on them for a bit. But perhaps we're embarrassed you know, going to church is not the, the done thing the way it was a number of years ago. Perhaps we are unsure in what we believe or what it means. Perhaps we are unsure on what to expect if we were to invite someone to church. Are we going to get a barrage of abuse? Or maybe we've had some bad experiences. We've tried to do something and we've come up against some form of brick wall. And if you've done that, I, I feel it. You don't want to try again. It is really tough. But my experience is that if it's a sense of it coming from God, of it coming from the Holy Spirit, then it has always been beneficial, worthwhile, and actually life-giving for me to do it. I'll give you one more personal example. When I was in my kind of late teens, um, I, like a lot of people in the late teens, I stopped going to church. I prefer to have a lion in a Sunday and then I went to my dance classes afterwards. 
And um, I started to get this sense that I wanted to go back to church. I wanted to go back. But for months, I didn't know how to say to my dad, can I come to church with you on Sunday? I didn't know how to say that because I didn't know what to expect. And I was kind of embarrassed in some ways to ask and embarrassed that I'd stopped going in the first place. You know, all those kind of mix of emotions. You get. And eventually, um, eventually I did go back and it was one of the most profound um, experiences I've had uh, in a church service. I don't remember the service at all, but I remember my experience of it. And that's no disrespect to my minister at the time. This eunuch has this strange chap started to run alongside his chariot, asking him if he knows what he's reading. There's an alternative reading that Scott gave the other day as he was putting the PowerPoint slide together. Of course I do, I wouldn't be reading it if I didn't know what it meant. Go away, leave me alone. He doesn't say that, does he? He welcomes Philip. He admits his confusion and he seems open enough to hear Philip's interpretation and to gain a different understanding of both the text and this God who he's been to Jerusalem to worship. And that happens for the eunuch because of the encouragement and accompaniment of Philip. In a liminal time, in a liminal space, and the ability to open up doubt and question and curiosity, the encouragement and accompaniment of another person might be enough asked to be baptized and went away joyfully. So here's my second question. Do we as a church nationally, locally, offer that sense of encouragement and accompaniment enough when we come up against those preventative barriers that are often within us? Do we offer that? Can we do it more? And here's my offer. If your question is, I have these preventions, I would really like the accompaniment of someone else that can help me unpack it and see differently. If that is you, I would like to be that accompanier. I am not someone who's great at knocking on doors and having random chit chat. I can do it, but I'm not great at it. But I do think I have the gifting to sit with you and help you unpack the way the eunuch unpacks with Philip. I can't offer everything as your minister, but I'd like to offer this now, particularly as we're sitting in this liminal moment of not knowing what the future holds, but knowing we can't go back to where we were 15 months ago. And at the very least, can we pray for each other as we all face liminal spaces and preventative barriers, be they external or internal? And may God bless us in those moments. Amen. I am hoping we might now sing, we know that Christ is raised and if something comes up, else comes up, we'll go with it. Aha. Uh -huh. okay. Let me share my screen. i 
creation shakes the church of God. Baptize me. I have a few intimations um, I'd like to share with you. The first is um, a bit of a celebration in that during the week, um, our small eco-congregation uh, team that consists of Jim Cullough, Trisha Ingalls, Leslie McFarlane and Forbes Winchester met with the eco-congregation assessors um, to apply and be assessed for the bronze um, award. Um, and during that assessment, which I'm told went on for at least an hour and a half and was quite tiring, um, at the end of it all, they decided actually we were available, where we were able to be awarded a silver award. So we applied for bronze and we, um, we gained a silver. And as I said to both Jim and Trisha when I spoke to them during the week, that, that they did a lot of work in terms of pulling together the paperwork and presenting it, but actually it's a whole congregational effort. Um, in terms of, of what we do to um, reduce our impact on the planet. Whether that's um, me picking out the pen fairy pens from the garden and recycling them with Teeling School to um, as, as not using um, a single use plastic for tea and coffee. All those kind of things really added up. Um, and they were particularly impressed by our, um, a, our input to things like starter packs, our use of fair trade and the uniform pop-up shop. So all of that um, means a silver award and that's really exciting. So hopefully um, in the not too distant future we'll have those awards to display somewhere. We had another significant birthday in the congregation during the week so our very happy birthday to Malcolm Bell who um, was 70. He's not here so I'm just going to tell you all. Um, if you were here I wouldn't have revealed it but you know. Um, so I a uh, happy birthday to uh, Malcolm during the week. Um, another one is uh, Caroline Taylor and uh, members of her congregation, the City Centre St Andrews and Meadowside St Paul's, were doing Kilt Walk yesterday for Christian Aid. Um, Christian Aid um, uh, fundraising over the last year has been impacted and so a number of people have been doing Kilt Walks. So C Caroline has done a Kilt Walk. The, um, she has a, a online giving page that if you want to um, sponsor her through that um, and if not if um, yourself or, or somebody you knows not online but would like to sponsor her um, we'll gather up and um, any cash donations and donate them online for her and um, there's a number of people did kilt walks but Caroline um, is in many ways the one closest to our own congregation. Um, uh, another plug for our soup uh, veg for soup and baked potatoes on a Thursday between 10 and 12. Each week we've done this, we've had to double our order each week and each week we, I was going to say sell out, run out, um, which is great news. Um, and uh, we had um, some uh, a reporter from the Courier there on Thursday looking at what we're doing and the woman who runs it with Stir Fresh, the co charity coordinator there, is really impressed by um, our engagement with the community and, and what that looks like. So a reminder, that that's on and for those who have got working families or cannot get out we can either order online through our website or um, phone and, and order them online uh, by phone. The final thing to say is that um, Scott and I are taking some leave um, uh, so we will be working this week um, uh, just because of the way our actual <laughs> holidays worked out, we'll be going away on Saturday. So the next two Sundays, <clears throat> um, we won't be doing a service like this way. The, the invitation is to join with um, 
James Wilson, who's the interim moderator at Mickey Me Bigging Monies and Teeling. He has a Zoom service at the same time. Um, I've sent those details to the Kirk session and Moira and Kathy, I will get the details to you um, separately, how to join that Zoom um, and also um, anyone else that an elder should be able to, to give you the details. So there'll be two weeks with James via Zoom. Um, we'll return to this platform on the 16th of May when I come back off leave on the 15th. We'll have a service on the 16th. Um, potentially thinking about Christian Aid because that's at the end of Christian Aid week. Um, and then the following week, we are transitioning back into the building. Um, because of the limitation in numbers, um, it's going to be on a Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. and a Sunday morning at 11 a.m. There's going to be a requirement, if you desperately want a space on either one of those, is to book it. Um, and Dorothy Cullough's doing the bookings um, and her phone number um, will make available, it will be on the website and everything else, but it's 534844. So Dorothy Colour, 534844 to book um, for the week um, that is the 19th and 23rd of May, and that's Pentecost. So it seems a nice day to kind of go back into the building. Um, the usual limitations that we had previously will still be there. So we will still have to wear face covering to still be a, a two meter distance. There won't be any singing. Um, and we're also conscious that there are a number of people who either can't get vaccinated or are, are still shielding to some extent that don't want to come back to the building at this, this time. And that's fine. Um, and the hope is that we will live stream the Sunday morning service, um, probably through YouTube and um, we will still make the DVDs and CDs, etc., available to those who can't join us. So it's slightly complicated, but I will write it all out and, and share it with you. Um, basically, you're with James Wilson, if you wish to be, on the next two weeks, then a week with me on Zoom, and then back in our buildings. But if you can or don't want to come into the building for whatever reason, there will still be an opportunity to, to worship online. So, big deep breath after all that. With all that said, um, we bring our prayers um, for the world before God let us pray. God of apostles, eunuchs and chariot drivers, we are part of such an amazing world filled with beauty, truth and joy. As our congregation celebrates the recognition of all the ways that we seek to protect and work with the natural world, we ask that we do not become complacent, always seeing care of your creation as integral to our response to your love. We are part of an interconnected world, brought closer both by technology and a virus. And the news that we hear and see can hit us remorsely. Devastation in India as people die without appropriate care and the world's richest withhold oxygen and vaccines. Grief and anguish in Indonesia as families and a nation mourn the loss of servicemen at the bottom of the sea. Continued destruction of Amazon rainforest in Brazil, as those tasked with protecting it face violence and dwindling resources. Ongoing violence in Myanmar, two months after their military took power, with the numbers dying and detained continuing to rise. A potential political, political vacuum and unrest in Chad as our military leader dies fighting hot alongside his soldiers. Tensions overflow in the land of the Holy One, where peace is a concept few have experienced. As we are hit by these images and news, we pray for an end to suffering, an outflowing of grace and mercy, 
and for your love to be known in every corner of the earth. Even with this barrage of anguish, we know that not every story of pain and heartache hits the headlines. So today we pray for all those who find life hard, that they may find some clear way through the difficulties they face. We pray for all those for whom life is full of hurtful words and nastiness. May people learn to, make, to be more compassionate towards others. We pray for all those who live in fear and terrible conditions. May a way be found for all to live in peace and where fresh water and a degree of comfort is not a luxury. We pray for all those for whom life is relentless and tiring. May respite be known in the care and presence of others. And we pray for those who rest on our own hearts this day. Remembering Ron, Rachel, Bob, Neil, Alan. As we give thanks for the abundance of blessings in our own lives, we ask for courage to see and hear the voices around us as in unique experiences of life today and as echoes of your own call for justice and peace. Give us the wisdom and foresight to share our faith appropriately, to exclude no one, and to trust each moment of connection to your love. For we seek to follow not just in the footsteps of Jesus and Philip, but of all the saints who have gone before us, helping us and teaching us in the ways of faith, now at rest in your grace, through Christ Jesus, the risen Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Our final hymn echoes that sense of inclusion of all, no matter what. Let us build a house where love can dwell. Build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome. A house where her prophets speak and words are strong and true, where all God's children dare to seek to dream God's reign anew. Here the cross shall stand as witness and a symbol of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome, all are welcome, all welcome in this place. Let us build a house where her hands will reach beyond the wood and stone, to heal and strengthen, serve and teach, and live the word they've known. Hear the outcast and the stranger, 
bear the image of God's face. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all our names, their songs and visions heard, and loved and treasured, taught and claimed as words within the word, built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome. In each day to come, may you spend moments noticing the God who inhabits our world and indwells your life. See, hear, taste and know the God who is all and gives all in love. And may the blessing of this holy God, creator, Christ and spirit, Rest upon you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore.